Good morning, everybody. What is this divine music that is playing in the background? Pretty awesome. I'm glad to be here in worship with you all today. Welcome. I'm Pastor Lance Richards, and today we are beginning a brand new teaching series called Flourish. And this is a series that's more than a series. It's a, it's a, a campaign. It's a time for us to reevaluate our commitments to God in all areas of our life and to see the next part of the vision God has given the watershed come to life before our eyes. And so it's going to be an exciting journey. Today I want to talk to you about flourishing in our faith as individuals, that a flourishing faith can change everything. It can change everything. I want to introduce you to one of my friends. His name is Robert. Uh, when I met Robert, I was at an a introductory meeting with a new church that I was being called to be pastor at and being appointed to. And uh, Robert wasn't around the table during the interview and the dinner. Uh, Robert just randomly walked through the room, the big fellowship hall we were in, you know, checked the AC, kind of shuffled a few things and then walked out. And as he left, somebody said, oh, that's Robert. Robert's one of the patriarchs of the church. He's the bedrock around here. I went, oh, kind of straightened up in my chair a little bit. It's Robert. You know, and he didn't come across as real friendly in that moment. I just kind of thought, he wasn't really here to check the AC. He was here to check me, right? I mean, he wandered through. He wanted to see what this new pastor was going to be all about, and he left. Well, five weeks later, uh, we pulled up at the parsonage, the church-owned home that we would be living in, uh, in our budget truck, pulling my car with Rachel's car caravan behind it. I'd just driven two days across uh, the country, halfway across the country, and all of our belongings on earth were behind me in this big truck. And there was a cadre, it was about 5.30 in the evening, and there was a whole host of teenagers waiting to help unload this truck, and they were all football players, and I was very grateful and tired. And so got the car unhooked, and boy, they started un unloading stuff from that truck in record time, and I became like air traffic controller you know, I was, put that there, that goes there, the table goes there, let's carry that in the back room, put that out back. And I was just boom, 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 boom. And I look up and there's Robert standing uh, in our kitchen, kind of like this. It's like, whoa, where did you come from? I didn't see him walk in. And so I take a break from my air traffic controlling and I go and, you know, make some small talk. And, and Robert says, you're going to be in the office tomorrow morning at 8? And I look at my watch and I said, inside, of course, you know how you have these internal conversations that you wouldn't necessarily have outside. I said, hmm, it's now about 7 o'clock in the evening, and I haven't unpacked a single box. I don't know where my socks and underwear are right now. I'm tired. I've been driving across the country for two days. Yes, I'll be in the office tomorrow morning at 8. I learned that Robert was the church treasurer and that I would be working really, really closely with him. Uh, consequently, Robert walked out at that point, and I resumed my flight attending duties. He walked out the back door, and I began to wonder, is this really our home, right? I mean, just think about that for a moment. Okay, not too long. Uh, and so anyway, I got up the next morning, found the underwear and socks and that whole thing, uh, got up early, you know, got ready for the day, was sitting down to eat my breakfast, and the phone rang in the parsonage. It was 6.50 a.m., and I'll never forget because I learned on that phone call before I had set foot to meet with Robert in the office that I would be doing my very first funeral in that place for somebody I had never met, but that the community knew really, really well. And I asked, are you sure you don't want to call the pastor that just moved out a couple of days ago to come and do the funeral? And he said, no, we want you to do it. Well, I walked into the office at 7.55 and Robert was there. And he already knew that I would be doing a funeral for somebody I'd never met before, but that he knew really well. And there was another challenge. The, pastor the church decided to turn over pastors at the same time they were refurbishing their entire sanctuary. So the construction crews were still in the building working, right? And so we rushed that through together. And, and the first service in that newly refurbished 150-year-old sanctuary was actually the funeral. But Robert journeyed with me. And I felt like by the time I got to the service, I knew the person that we were celebrating and remembering and commending to God that particular day. Robert and I grew really close. I, I found out that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover because Robert wore hearing aids in both ears. He spent his life working in a plant and he all but lost his hearing in his daily responsibilities. And so in a crowd of people, he doesn't say a lot because it makes his hearing aids feedback. And he feels very awkward in those situations. 
I saw Robert every Monday morning when he was religiously there to count the money, do the deposit, and do our bookkeeping. I saw Robert every day as he picked up the mail from the post office, because that's what you do in a little small town. You go to the post office to get your mail. Well, Robert did that, and he'd bring it in, and I'd get to talk to him every day. We journeyed through a lot together. Robert and his family, three generations, sat on the front row, just to my right. They were always about this close when I preached, and, and I, I watched that family welcome in new children. I, I got to preside over the wedding of several of his grandchildren, saw great-grandchildren being born, saw families dividing and going their separate ways within that extended family. And, and I remember one, another morning, the, the phone rang in the parsonage, and it was about 6.30 in the morning, and I found out that Robert's son had been involved in a tragic accident. And next thing I knew, I was standing next to Robert by his son's bed in the ER at the trauma hospital. And I journeyed with him to the graveside as we laid his son to rest and walked with him for years afterwards. And I saw within Robert a deep and abiding faith that changed me, especially not only in the way that he dealt with the death of his son, he dealt with that the way that he dealt with everything else in his life, with kindness, with generosity, with deep and abiding faith and trust in God. And even at the bedside, while he was saying goodbye to his son, he was there caring for his family and for the other people that God put around him. Now, we had words about grieving together privately over a lot of periods of time, because that's important as well, but his nature and his faith was outwardly facing. It was to make sure that everybody else was okay. And I treasure the time that I got to know Robert, because my faith grew stronger because of him. And the faith of that church was stronger because of him. And that faith, in, in a lot of ways, that church followed Jesus as they looked to Robert and to the Jesus in Robert. Well, I, I bring up this story because I believe Robert had a flourishing faith, a deep and abiding faith, a faith that I wanted to learn to have even as a pastor in my early 30s. I wanted a faith like that, and I saw it in Robert, and I learned it from Robert. Well, we have a church full of people whose faith is flourishing and part of our series this month is going to be learning from the flourishing faith of those that God has placed right around us. I want you to, well, for some of you, these are people that you've known for a long time, but if you're meeting them for the first time, I want to introduce you to Rebecca and Anita, and they're going to share a little bit about their faith journey at Through the Watershed with us this morning. <laughs> I can remember, I can't remember not being, and I feel very blessed to ha have that as a foundation in my family, and for that to be an important part of my life that way, I, I feel like I wouldn't have as strong of a family if we didn't have our faith as our foundation. I came to the watershed uh, when the church was first built. I was raised a Methodist and had attended several other Methodist churches around here and had not found one that I felt like was really my home. And I got the brochure in the mail that said the watershed was going to be opening down the street. And I thought, well, that's really close, so I'll try it. And the first day I walked in, I just fell in love with it and I felt like it was truly my home. Um, we've been going to the watershed for few years now and just wanted to talk to you today about stewardship. Because I love the church so much, I felt like that was something that I had to do. I had to give back to the watershed. And uh, several of my friends and I started volunteering once a week up here at the church, helping Paige out because we knew there was so much that she couldn't get to and we loved her so much we wanted to help. I am a retired teacher, so I got involved in to dive into worship with a lot of insistence by Tanya. But I love that because we get to work with children of many different ages and many different personalities. And through working in to dive into worship, I got to be really good friends with a lot of special people here at the watershed that otherwise I may not have met. Uh, I've really uh, used my sign language most there to the praise and worship music. And I, I just, I really uh, enjoy doing that and I really feel like um, I have a different 
worship experience when I'm doing that too. Um, it's worshiping in a, a completely different way. And uh, I find it really interesting, you know, going through that process, it makes you really have to think about what the songs are actually saying. What What's the actual meaning? Because you don't just do a translation that's word, 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 word. You're translating the concepts. So you really have to think, what does that actually mean, you know? The watershed is truly a home to me. And when you are at a home, you do stuff as the members of a home, but also you learn to become the hands and feet of God. So I, I know Anita and I know Rebecca, and I know that they have a flourishing faith that is lived well beyond the sanctuary. It's a faith that you can see and experience wherever it is that they are as they shed God's love to anyone who's in front of them. They both will tell you how they witness every day, and it, it just exudes from them. A flourishing faith changes everything. It gives you a perspective on life that you wouldn't get any other way. It helps you to truly be in step with God. It allows you to take your cues about who you are through God's eyes. There's nothing like it. And it changes your life and through you changes the world. Throughout the series, I want you to know this fundamental truth. That when you flourish individually in your faith, then you lead the church to flourish because we all are the church, a part of the body of Christ, and a church is only as alive as its members are alive spiritually. So for this church to come to life, you have a part to play in it, and we need every one of you to be flourishing in your faith through the Holy Spirit. But a church that flourishes leads the community to flourish because through us, the community, uh, when churches flourish, and come together, the community begins to experience the kingdom of God. They get a taste of that and what it's going to be like. And then the community is like the city on a hill that, that pours out God's love into the world around it. And it just ripples out and continues on and on and on. And so I want you to hear as I begin today that your faith matters profoundly. It not only shapes the direction of your life, but it can shape the direction of the lives that God places around you. And we're going to dig into some scriptures that tell us just that. Our theme for this Flourish series comes from Ezekiel 47. And, and I picked this, this text when I was praying about what to do in the fall this year. About a year ago, it was well before Harvey was even something we were thinking about or had lived through together. And you're going to find in this passage a, a water or flood metaphor. And I actually really wrestled with whether or not to have this continue to be the theme and God kept saying, keep it, but you've all been through this common experience together, and it has been hard, and it has changed you, but, but you understand what this metaphor means so much more deeply now than you would have before the storm. And so I commend this passage to you with the sensitivity of, of what we've all experienced together. But to me, this text epitomizes what it means to be the watershed. I'm going to read it from the message translation today, so if you've got NIV or NLT or something else, it's going to look a little funny, uh, but listen closely to these words, and I hope that they nourish your soul as we read God's word together. Now he brought me back to the entrance to the temple. I saw water pouring out from under the temple porch to the east. The temple faced east. The water poured out from the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then took me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the gate complex on the east. The water was gushing from under the south front of the temple. He walked to the east with a measuring tape and measured off 1,500 feet, leading me through the water that was ankle deep. He measured off 1,500 feet, leading me through water that was knee deep. He measured off 1,500 feet, leading me through water that was waist deep. By now it was a river over my head, water to swim in, water no one could possibly walk through. He said, son of man, have you had a good look? Then he took me back to the riverbank. While sitting on the bank, I noticed a lot of trees on both sides of the river. He told me, this water flows east, descends to the Araba, and then into the sea, the sea of stagnant waters. When it empties into those waters, the sea will become fresh. Wherever the river flows, life will flourish. Great schools of fish, 
because the river is turning the salt sea into fresh water. Where the river flows, life abounds. Fishermen will stand shoulder to shoulder along the shore from the Engidi to all the way to the Engilium, casting their nets. The sea will teem with fish of all kinds, like the fish of the great Mediterranean. The swamps and marshes won't become fresh. They'll stay salty. But the river itself on both banks will grow fruit trees of all kinds. Their leaves won't wither. The fruit won't fail. Every month they'll bear fresh fruit because the river from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will be food and their leaves for healing. This is God's word for us today. Thanks be to God. What an amazing picture of what it means to be the watershed. Just to break it down a little bit, what begins at the temple in this passage in Isaiah, Ezekiel's vision rather, changes the world. As God's people are filled with God's love, that they're forgiven, that they praise and worship and give glory to God and get their life oriented in the way that God wants them to live. As they go out into the community, they bring that life with them and share it. We would say here, shed that love. And it begins to cause life to abound wherever it is that they go and they share that faith and that hope and that love that God has given them. And as they do this more and more and more, it grows deeper and wider and bigger and begins to consume the entire world. And wherever that love goes, it brings life to places that had long since died. Think of stagnant water. You ever been around... Uh, maybe you've gone to Brazos Bend State Park and you walk and you smell the marsh, all the algae growing on the stagnant ponds. It has an odor, doesn't it? It doesn't support much life. Well, maybe an alligator or two, but, but there's not much that can live in it. You know, the Dead Sea was that way. It was closed. There was no water coming into or out of it. Without that fresh water coming in or, or filtering through, it festers and nothing can survive in it. When we center our lives on Jesus Christ, when we truly make God the chief end of our striving, when we have a deep and abiding relationship with God, the life that God gives us flows from us and through us and brings life to the dead places in the world. Did you see that metaphor? Fishermen line up wherever this river flows that comes from the temple, from the believer's relationship with God. Fishermen line up because they know the waters are going to be full of food for the day. Can you picture that standing shoulder to shoulder, looking for what God wants to give them? And then on either side of the river, this river that flows from the temple, there are trees that bear fruit in every season whose leaves are for healing. That's what's at stake when we as God's people have a flourishing faith. Our flourishing faith changes everything for us and through our life change changes the lives of those around us and you see how God's love begins to build into larger and larger bodies of love that overtake the entire world. Did you see that? It became a river to swim in. You couldn't stand up in it anymore so you had to play in it, splash around, swim. That's the kind of life that God wants to give all of us. Here in March, we adopted what we call the 15-1500 vision and the numbers really have nothing to do with the vision fulfilled. They're just there to remind us that, that God calls us to grow. And it's not about numeric growth. It's about spiritual growth. But if we are growing spiritually and our faith is flourishing, we better be ready for what God's going to bring. And so it's just that challenge that, that keeps us there before. But here's in short the words of the vision. In 15 years, the watershed hopes to gather as 1,500 people in worship who are growing as disciples and Christian leaders to meet the spiritual and physical needs of our neighbors and to shed God's love to our community. But here's the picture of the vision fulfilled. You ready for this? When we live this way as an individual and as a church, children will have everything that they need in the community to flourish. Marriages will be strengthened, not weakened. Parents will be partnered with and equipped to help raise their children in the faith. They'll know that they're not alone. Those who are addicted will find help. Those who have been wounded or cast aside by the church We'll find a place of meaningful service and we will join together and create a movement that takes God's love to the farthest corners of this Bay Area and beyond. I could go on and on and on, but man, that's our big picture vision, just like Ezekiel 47, what the community looks like changed. So how do we get there? How do we get to the place that we are, we are moving and contributing to a vision like this? 
well, we have to flourish individually. And I have to admit that, that very often when we think about flourishing individually, our mind immediately takes us to those outward signs of the faith. It takes us to service. And we think, okay, well, I'm busy, so I'll just sign up for a few things, and I'll go and do them, and then I'll, I'll do what God wants me to do. Well, that feels like the quick and the easy fix. But the problem is we can't short-circuit building a relationship with God. If we're doing all of the outward things without cultivating the inward life, then we're serving from an empty well. And what we're offering to those who live around us is not what God can pour into our lives and wants to pour into theirs. It comes from a very shallow well, almost a dead sea. Here's the first thing I want us to know, that for our faith to flourish, we have to have an individual experience with in order to bring this kind of life to others, we have to experience it ourselves. Now, how do we do that? Well, there are no shortcuts. I don't know if you've ever heard this old phrase, and I'm probably going to misquote it, but it goes something like this, that sometimes we can be so busy doing the work of God that we forget to spend time with God. And I really experience that as someone whose vocation is within the church to lead the whole people of God out in ministry. I pray. I pray every day, but I catch myself praying for you all instead of praying for myself. I read God's word, I read it every day. But if I'm not careful, I'm reading for the next sermon and not listening to how God is speaking a word into my life. You see this? I fall into that trap even as a pastor too, even though I'm doing all the right things. Sometimes I get into this place where I realize I'm not cultivating my relationship with the Father. I'm not listening. I'm not praying. I'm not letting God do his work in and I find myself pouring out from an empty well. If you want to bring this kind of life to others that Ezekiel describes, you've got to have a personal experience with God. Now, how do we do this? We do it over time, and that's the important thing to know. It starts today, but it continues tomorrow, into next month and into next year. I mean, Robert was 83 when I met him. 83. He had been cultivating this faith throughout his entire life, and it was catalytic. Now, he didn't do, I mean, he was not an extroverted person. He wasn't standing on a a soapbox on the street preaching, but his life spoke. It spoke more than any of the words that I could even share with you today. And that's what we're talking about. But it's, here's how you do it. It's through prayers prayed over a lifetime. It's through spending time reading God's word in wherever place you do that in your home daily and asking God, how are you speaking to me the reading of this word today. It comes through gathering together for worship. There is no mistake that the vision that God gave Ezekiel in this passage was given from the temple out because this is the place where the people of God come together as one to center their whole aim and focus on God, the giver of life. That's what we do when we come together and why it's so very important that we not neglect gathering, as it says in Hebrews, together as some have been in the habit of doing And we grow a flourishing faith by studying the Bible in community with other people through Bible study. And you do that over time. Well, sometimes our focus is off, and and we make all the excuses in the world, and I'm, man, I'm guilty of this too in my own life. I'm a great excuse maker. I'll get around to it one day. We've all probably done it. God, I I don't have time to pray every day. I'm too busy doing your work, right? I'll I'll pray one day when my calendar gets less full. Well, guess what? It's never going to get less full. Because the habits that you cultivate right now are the habits that you're going to continue to cultivate. You've got to just make space. Put in the big rocks. Make prayer a priority first before you add any of that other stuff. And you say, well, you know, I'm so busy. Sunday's my only day of rest. One day when I retire, then I'll go to worship every week. Friends, you are starving your soul if you're telling yourself that lie. There's something about gathering together in the presence of God with God's people each week that continues to let fresh water flow into your life and keeps you from stagnating. You might think, well, I'm so tired that I was up late you know, getting the house in order and preparing my kids' lunches before I went to bed, and I had to get up early and do it all over again. I don't have time to spend reading God's Word. Friend, you are starving yourselves. Make it a priority. Bring fresh water in so that God will fill your well. You want to know the truth? And when I really got down to the bottom of this, this was the praying this text for me moment in preparing for this sermon. 
We don't want the cost. We don't want the cost. God has this fountain of living water that he's ready to give us. And we say, but God, it will cost me too much. It will cost me everything. I'm not, I don't know if I'm ready to change my life. I no, don't know if I'm ready to give everything to you. I just want to hold on to this myself. Because see, here's the way culture forms us. This is the truth, right? We pursue the next bigger paycheck, the next biggest house, the next new car, the next dream vacation, and we'll show up to worship whenever we're feeling empty. Oh, man, things aren't going my way again. I've reached the end of myself. Let me go to worship, get my hit, get my quick fix, and then I'll be about my work again. And we show up to worship, and it doesn't do for us what we thought that it should do. And then we leave empty, and we go, well, that was a waste of time. But it's not about us. And it's not something that can be cultivated in a moment. You walk in, you're, I'm magically filled up again. I'm ready to do this thing. No. It's cultivated over time as we build this deep and abiding relationship with God. Think about how you fall in love with someone. You do by spending time together. You do by talking. You do by listening. It's no different. You can't short circuit this. You can't shortcut this relationship with God. If you want to flourish in faith, you've got to spend time with God every single day. And I want to tell you, Proverbs gives us a great way to frame this in Proverbs eleven twenty eight. Check this out. It says, a life devoted to things is a dead life, a stump. A God-shaped life is a flourishing tree. Now, do you see this? When the passage, when Jesus teaches, seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness and all of this will be added to you as well, that's the God-shaped stuff. He says, look, culture, you've got it backwards. Instead of pursuing your own ends and trying to live like everybody else, pursue God's ways first and then see that God helps you prioritize all the stuff that he's going to bring into your midst. Then you'll know what to do with it. Then you'll become that river of living water that lets God's goodness flow through you to bless others. But if you've got it backwards, that's when you're going to stagnate and get stale. And you're not going to experience life that abounds within your own. Did you see that? That kind of life that's lived in pursuit of things is like a stump. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a stump become a big tree again. I've seen little trees grow beside a stump and kind of attach to it and go up. Different tree. But I've never seen a stump produce a big tree. It's a, it's a life that's lopped off. But did you see what a God-shaped life looks like? What does it bring about? A flourishing tree. And that remind you of Ezekiel's words, a tree that brings fruit for every season and whose leaves are for healing. When you seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness, what you do with your stuff falls into line and it's a pretty amazing thing. There's a psalm, Psalm 42, 1 and 2. Let these words sit deeply in your soul for just a moment. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When can I go and meet with God? That's how you begin to cultivate a flourishing faith. You make God your number one chief aim. Your soul has to thirst for God. Think about a runner for a moment. I, I spoke with somebody who was running the other day, and her legs gave out because she hadn't hydrated. She had to quit running. But when she hydrates, she's ready for the race, to run the race to completion. And it's the same thing. Just as we should quench the thirst with water to be able to be a good runner, we need to, to, to quench our soul with the water that comes from God so that we can finish the race with faith and persevere to the end. But we have to long for God more than we long for the next higher paycheck or the next newer car or the next dream vacation. Now, this doesn't mean that following God means that you've got to quit your work and live in a bungalow not what I'm saying at all, although God might call you to do that, and that might open up some pretty exciting possibilities. I just talked to somebody who sold their home, moved to a new place, and is living on a small boat on the water in Kima. That's awesome, and waiting for the next thing that God's going to do. But do you see the priorities that that shows? You seek first that deep and abiding relationship with God, and God provides the direction and allows everything that you have to be a blessing. Paul wanted this so desperately for the people of Philippi. In fact, at the very beginning of his letter to the Philippians, he prays that their faith would flourish and translate into love that abounds. Look at this. 
as we read this together. He says, so this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Isn't that cool? This is also the message, y'all, just in case. Uh, Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus will be proud of, bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. See, doesn't this bring that Ezekiel passage to life? You love much and well. Your love is just not empty, sentimental gush coming from an empty well, but it comes from the deep, abiding love of God already at work within your soul. You see this? When you make Jesus your chief aim. And I love what it says at the very end of that passage. Can you put it up one more time? Look what it leads to. Bountiful and fruits from the soul. Doesn't that sound like the trees, again, from Ezekiel and Proverbs? Bearing fruit that feeds people, whose leaves are for healing. And look at this. When you live this way, it makes Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. Did you know your faith can do that? When you do the hard soul work, when you cultivate this deep and abiding faith in in God through Jesus Christ every day, your faith changes the world. Now tell me now if it's not worth reordering a few priorities in your life. So I told you that, that Flourish is not only a teaching series, but it's also a campaign a time to change habits and to to look forward to seeing the next step in the vision God has given us accomplished. Now, we are focusing in 2018 on growing as disciples. Right now, I've been saying this every week, only 30% of our worshiping attendance is in a small group. And that needs to be everybody so that we don't stagnate. If we're going to transform the community, then we as a church need to flourish. And if we as a church are flourishing, that means that we're all as individuals flourishing. And so we want to invest in things that help us to grow as disciples. In our budget for 2018, we realize that growing in our faith is going to take gifted staff people to help disciple us. And so we've had, believe it or not, for the entire history of the watershed, part-time directors of children's ministry and youth ministry. We need to make those full-time. One for staff longevity so that people are developing relationships with us over a longer period of time, but also for depth, right? I mean, the longer that somebody's around, the the more deeply they're forming their faith and and journeying with us as we form ours, and so that's going to be an important piece. We also want to hire a part-time pastor of adult discipleship and pastoral care. We need to cultivate some new environments for us to grow and help make deeper groups as awesome as they possibly can be, and somebody spending some time just focusing on that is going to help us really ramp up our adult discipleship. We're going to ask you to be a part of supporting these initiatives in our 2018 budget. So here's our our, uh, journey for our Flourish effort. It's not just about giving financially. It's about growing a flourishing faith in God and taking your next steps in the faith. So I'm going to ask you to do these five things with me. Pray. Join a prayer huddle. Uh, Today, for instance, uh, we're meeting at Clear Creek High School at 208 to pray. Clear Creek High School is where we began worshiping as a congregation for the very first time publicly. And it happened in the year 2008, hence 208. Uh, We're going to look at God, give thanks for where God's brought us, and we're going to face outward toward the world and to say, God, lead us faithfully into whatever you have for us next. It's going to be a neat moment to come together. So I hope you'll join me after lunch, 208 Clear Creek High School. Don't miss a single week in worship. These series messages build upon one another, and you'll learn a little bit more each week about what uh, we feel God calling us to accomplish together in 2018. We want you to deepen. Uh, We have a new Tuesday group. If you're not in a deeper group, that's going to meet right up here information there in your bulletin about that. And so we hope you'll join the study for these four weeks or to study it with your deeper group. We'll have information online uh, by Monday morning curriculum that you can do with your deeper groups or as individuals. We want you to impact. Did you know every Saturday at 830 we meet up here and we go out and, and serve in a flood, uh, a flood home, helping that homeowner to improve their situation. We get new homes in all the time. And if you'll show up Saturday at 830 right here, we'll send you out. And then we want it to culminate in supporting the 2018 budget and making a pledge to do so. We've never really done this before. And so we're stepping out in bold faith that that God's going to provide for the vision that God's placed on our heart. And so you'll be receiving some information in the mail uh, within the next couple of weeks that will really dig deep into what we hope to accomplish there in 2018. Here's a brief calendar. Uh, You'll see on on the schedule that we, we worship. 
every Sunday and do our prayer huddle. We do flood relief every Saturday. A couple of notable dates. October 22nd is our commitment Sunday where we'll bring those pledges to God and, and commit to take those next steps in the faith. And then we're going to do a prayer huddle after each service on our land that day to prepare for 2032 and this vision of 1500 on our campus is realized. And then on November 12th, we're going to have Celebration Sunday by doing a big church-wide Thanksgiving picnic where we'll come together, hear what God is doing through us, and enjoy games and food on the ground. It's going to be an amazing day. So I hope you'll mark your calendars for that. I don't want you to just hear it from me. I want you to hear from my Anita and my Rebecca, those uh, strong folks, those bedrock of the faith who live among us to hear what they have to tell us as well as we bring this to a close. Um. We, we are commanded to give of our time and our service and our finances. And I just feel like I'm honoring God by doing that. Okay, now we're going to talk about money, which I know for a lot of people sometimes is a hard subject. And I will be very honest with y'all. I have never tithed until I came to the watershed. It was like I never really felt it in my heart. And I don't know, at one point, one day, John, John, God said, Anita, you need to tithe. I do believe that when you step out and give, you, you have growth as a Christian. Um, I'm currently still working on that myself. I've been stuck at a certain level of giving for a while myself and uh, every once in a while I think okay could I give more haven't gotten there yet we're all growing uh, but I do give very faithfully and I'm, I'm a firm believer in that that is part of what being a Christian is all about since I have started tithing it's like that money has never disappeared because God has given me so much love, so much joy. And honestly, the money never does disappear because when you have the love of God in your heart and he comes into your heart, and I will tell you, he will come into everyone's heart if you just open up your heart and let him in. If you listen to him, he talks to all of us daily. And he came to me and said, Anita, you will tithe. That is what I expect my children to do. To me, when I, when I give, whether it be my time, my service, my finances, it just means I'm honoring God and giving glory to Him. Thank you, Anita, and thank you to Rebecca for sharing a little bit of your faith journey uh, when it comes to flourishing faith with us. Another way that we cultivate a flourishing faith is by receiving communion by coming and asking forgiveness for our sins. It's receiving the body and blood of our Lord and being sent out to minister once again in Jesus' name. I want you to know something today, that no matter where you've come from, no matter what is going on in your life, no matter how unworthy you may feel, no matter what you have done, you are welcome at this table. 